Thanks for checking out this movie review. So this is for the 1982 film Halloween 3 Season of the Witch, which if you're watching this review and you have already seen the film, you know that this is the one movie in the Halloween franchise that has nothing to do with Michael Myers, and there's kind of some backstory on that. And actually, if you're watching this, you probably even know that. I'll go over it briefly for people who may not know that information, but you know. Uh, I do want to say, why am I doing this video? Eventually I was going to get to this film, it probably was going to be further down the line for me, but I'm doing it now because there were a lot of people who really wanted Joe Bob Briggs on his most recent, uh, his H Halloween special, or as he called it, his, the Halloween Hoot Nanny on Shudder, really, really wanted him to do Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Uh, people apparently have been asking him to do it for quite some time, and he won't do it. I don't know if it's because he's saving it for another time, but it kind of seems to me like he hates the movie. I can't really blame him. For this movie, honestly, you have to be a person who finds enjoyment in movies that are kind of crappy, but like fun crappy. So um, I am that person, so I enjoy this film for that reason. But uh, at the same time, I feel like Joe Bob enjoys a lot of crappy, fun films too. So it's, you know, I don't know. So anyway, this is my kind of humble offering to the masses out there who are, were let down by not getting Halloween 3 uh, reviewed or the get the Joe Bob treatment. So I can't give the Joe Bob treatment, obviously, but I'm going to do my best to just break down this film, give you my thoughts on it, and do a good review, and hopefully people enjoy it. So there you go. All right, so like I said, from 1982, Halloween 3, Season of the Witch. Uh, real quick, if you have not already seen this film and you want to, go back and watch it, then come back to this because spoilers, all spoilers. So this was uh, written and directed by Tommy Lee Wallace, who also wrote Amityville 2, The Possession, and he wrote and directed Fright Night Part 2. So that's where he's coming from. Um, although, I'll talk a little bit. He, he wrote it. He has the writing credit, but I'll talk a little bit about that later. It's, he didn't actually write the whole script uh, slash story. So John Carpenter and Deborah Hill uh, were back as producers for this. They were producers for... Oh, wait. Were they both producing the first two? I don't know if they were, but they were both involved with the first two movies. So they came back for this one. And they basically said, they were asked, hey, would you come back and produce a Halloween 3? And they said, only if Michael Myers isn't involved. Which, you know, I can understand. If you're a filmmaker, you want to do different things. You know, you have creative ideas. If you're being asked for the same thing over and over and over again, that gets kind of boring. So if you have the opportunity to kind of advocate and say, hey, can I do something different? Can I do something more creative and fun? Let's do that. So uh, Hill and Carpenter basically said, we will do a Halloween 3 if we can make it something different. So the whole idea is John Carpenter really liked the idea of turning the Halloween franchise into more of an anthology series in a sense. And then from three on, kind of making it a situation where each of the movies would take place around and on Halloween and would be a self-contained story, not having to do with Michael Myers. So obviously that didn't go over well because Season of the Witch uh, did not do well all that well. It, it greatly underperformed for what was expected, but also um, people were... You know, in reviews, people were pretty upset about it. A lot of a lot of people just calling out, "Where's Michael Myers?" Uh, so they went back. Obviously, we all know the rest of the franchise. It's all Michael Myers, so it didn't really work out. But I would say this: obviously, there's been a, a resurgence. It's become a very cult film at this point. So I think it's kind of time. I mean, John Carpenter recently said that he'd be interested in directing another movie. I would hope it would be horror. Um, I kind of feel like it's time. Maybe this is the time for John Carpenter to go back and say, it's not necessarily going to be called Halloween, but let's do our own Halloween-related anthology series of movies now. Let's get it kick-started. And he doesn't have to do the whole thing. He can just do the first one and then set other people up to, you know, do some installments. But I feel like people are way more open to it now. There's been a bunch of anthology things over time. You know, people are very excited about the Shutter Creep Show series right now. Um... It seems like it's more the time, and plus the resurgence of, you know, Season of the Witch. So, not to be confused with the George A. Romero Season of the Witch movie, very different. Okay, so, even though it was called a dis disappointment, listen to this, the budget for it was $2.5 million. 
in the box office, it made $14.4 million. So it didn't lose money. It just underperformed for what the studio was thinking it should do. And that would be in comparison to Halloween's 1 and 2. They were, I, they were probably not expecting the same return from those two movies since it's, you know, the second sequel. But they were expecting much more. So it wasn't a flop. Uh, the idea was to make... Okay, I already talked about the anthology. Sorry about that. Uh, Familiar Foods which was an old milk bottling plant, was actually the setting for uh, the Shamrock, Silver Shamrock uh, factory, which I have to say, in this film, it looks run down and crappy, like, in the film. I feel like that kind of adds to its appeal, in, in my uh, estimation. Uh, at least for me personally, it kind of adds to the appeal. You would think that when... When a film like this is being made, and it's supposed to be like a current company that they would try and find a facility that looks like it's, you know, like not necessarily state of the art, but not looking super old and kind of run down, which this does in like a dying town. But um, I think it kind of works with the whole kind of being a little campy, kind of being a little crappy. I don't know. It kind of adds to the uh, the charisma or the charm of it, I want to say. I would say charisma, the charm of it. So let's talk about the, the script situation. So the person who originally wrote the script for it was a guy named Nigel Neal, K-N-E-A-L-E. -E. Um, he had done the films uh, Quatermass, the Quatermass films, and John Carpenter was a big fan of what he did with those, so he was like, hey, would you write the script for this? Um, so he submitted it, and it was kind of more of like a sci-fi, which there is still sci-fi to it, obviously. It is described as a sci-fi horror film. So um, the studio was like, Ugh, we want more violence and gore because that's what Halloween is. We, we need more of that. So there were some things that were definitely going to be changed with it. So Neil said, take my name off of the script. I don't want to be associated with it. It's not mine anymore because you're making these changes. So based off that, the script was then taken, given to Tommy Lee Wallace and said, fix it. You know, fix it per what the studio thought fixing meant. So he made his changes to it and it became his script then although a lot of the stuff was actually kept from the original apparently i don't know exactly what but um john carpenter and alan howarth did the soundtrack for this and i do have to say the soundtrack okay john carpenter is in a, in a is kind of an, a musical genius a lot of his music is very well done i think in halloween 3 it's kind of john carpenter dialed up to 11 uh it's kind of overboard, in my opinion, and there's some really shrill noises that happen, and they happen repeatedly, and it just gets annoying, and you're just kind of like, kind of got to plug my ears. Is this going to stop anytime soon? So it's just, it's over, it's over the top. A lot of the music is over the top. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. So this was John Carpenter dialed up to 11, but, you know, it kind of goes along with the ridiculousness of the film. Although I do have to say the Silver Shamrock song, that that is well done especially because people can't seem to get it out of their heads my wife included who watched this movie with me and she started singing it after the movie was done she kept repeating it i was like that's not me i didn't bring that back up she's like that song it just embeds in your head which is i think is the point that's kind of the genius of how that song was created is i think it was created to be familiar because it, it's to the 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 tune of london bridges falling down and, um, yeah, so it's already familiar to people. The fact that they repeat it so many times throughout the film, and it is just catchy in general, and it's simplistic. That's the other thing, so it's easy to remember. It really, like, as an audience member, just embeds itself in your head, and you just find yourself, after the movie, just going around and singing it. Or, at least, if not out loud, then just it's going around in your head. Which is great, because that's what's happening in the film. So it's kind of genius that that was the way the, the the song went because it's doing to the audience what it's doing to people in the actual movie, which is grabbing their attention and keeping their interest. And that kind of speaks more to, you know, what I'll kind of talk about in the end, which is the themes of kind of like consumerism and, you know, playing directly to kids, which was a big thing in the 80s. But I'll talk about that a little bit more later. So the masks for this were actually made by Post, a company called Post Studios, and they were contracted to do it, um, and then they made a bunch of masks as merchandise that were to sell for $25. So back in 1982, like, $25 obviously was a little bit more. Um, so, yeah, pretty decent cost for those masks. I guess they assumed that it would be kind of, kind of 
popular. I don't know. I, I, I would be interested to know if there's any information out there on, you know, sales of those masks. I, I wasn't able to find any easily, but I'd be interested to know. So for the people who are real big nerds with this film, there was a novelization of it. So you might want to go check that for that. Um, it, this, the script was taken and it was turned into a novel also in 1982 by Dennis Etchison, who actually wrote it under the surname of Jack Martin. One of the big changes apparently is that it alludes to the fact that Cochran in the end doesn't actually get killed by the piece of Stonehenge, but that he actually is like teleported somewhere to some other location. So he's still alive somewhere. So that's a big difference. Sorry, spoiler for the book, but it's old, whatever. <laughs> I told you spoilers. Um, the music, I already wrote the music about it getting annoying. The acting is not so great in this film, but that's part of the charm of the 80s. We all can agree with that. Tom Atkins is fun in his role, a lot of fun in his role. Um, and I think that, was it Dan O'Hurley, who's the guy who plays Cochran? He was great for that role because he does such a good job of playing of like walking that line of being like kind of evil and sinister, but also just being like a really nice, proper person. And he just, he walks that line very well, in my opinion. So he was cast extremely well. Tom Atkins, like I said, he's just fun. Everyone else kind of like their performances are pretty subpar and doesn't really necessarily matter that they were in the film, to be honest. Uh, Atkins and O'Hurley are the main ones. I mean, they have the most screen time anyway, so... Makes sense. Um, the fingers in the eyeballs kill. Let's talk about this. Very early on, that, that thing is like, yeah, okay. So the fingers in the eyeballs kill, it, it, like, it, it was weird. It was super weird, and you couldn't necessarily tell what was actually happening there because when the, eye, the fingers were going in, I initially was like, oh, he's poking, he's gouging his eyeballs out. But then he, like, does this move where it's like, Ugh. And I'm like, is he like breaking his nose from the inside and up or, and then it's not even like ever fully explained. It's just the coroner, I guess it's the coroner or forensic scientist is just kind of like says that they, they, it just like they destroyed the skull basically, which we understand that like that was kind of an effortless thing because you know, it was a robot, but you don't know that at the time. It's just like this really weird move. I've never seen anyone killed like that before. So I guess it gets points for being very unique in my opinion. Very, very unique. Um, I love how the sheriff says that the murder was drug-related, drug most likely, because it's so freaking absurd. Like, drug-related. Okay, this dude in a suit with black gloves on comes in, messes up this guy's skull, kills him, and then walks out, douses himself in gasoline, and blows up a car. Yeah, that screams drug-related. Like, the sheriff says this, and there's like... There's no evidence. The other thing is, when the sheriff's talking about this, it's the next day, and the car is still smoking and just sitting in the parking lot. Like, you think they would have worked on it, but they're just kind of, like, hanging out inside the hospital, just like, huh, yeah, what do you guys think about this? What do you guys... You should be processing the crime scene. They're not. So that's another thing. It's it's kind of weird. Um, the other thing is, it's weird in the beginning how it'll, it, it's like giving you dates. Like it starts on a Saturday and then it goes to a Sunday and then it goes Wednesday, Friday. So like when it's doing Saturday, Sunday, like it makes sense because you're like, oh, okay, it's going to track through each day until we get to Halloween, which makes sense with the whole commercial, how it, you know, it counts, counts down as well. But then you make the jump to Wednesday and you make the jump to Friday and there's not even much that goes on in some of those days. So literally, like, when they made the jump from, like, Sunday to Wednesday, then, like, Wednesday, it's, like, I think it was just, like, Tom Atkins' character just hanging out at the bar for a little bit. He talks with someone, and then it's just, like, Friday, and you're just, like, why did we even stop at Wednesday at all? So it's just, it's weird. It's weird. Like, why would you even do it? Um, I, the movie, okay, <laughs> I'm sorry. This This kind of throws me off when I'm talking about it, just because it's, like, the movie's kind of all over the place. If you've seen it, you know. The movie gets to trying to solve a mystery pretty fast. 
Uh, there's a, there's really not a whole lot of setup to the film. It's immediately like this mystery of let's solve something. You know, the guy in, in the very, very beginning running away, he's got the silver shamrock mask in his hand. He's hiding from these dudes who we would later find out are robots trying to kill him. Uh, and then the death happens and then we're investigating. And then this dude who's an alcoholic doctor <laughs> is just like, I'm going to solve this case. Apparently because he wants to bone the deceased's daughter because that becomes apparent at one point. It's just really funny. Um, but I like I like the like investigative mystery portion of it. I really do. I think that's the most fun because it's this kind of sense of adventure. It's like, where are we going? What's happening? And they, they do let things unfold slowly in a good way. So, there, you know, there's, there's some like legitimate good stuff about this film. Um... <laughs> I and okay, I wrote down. I love how hard they go on um, Dan, Tom Atkins' character, Dan. I love how hard they go on his alcoholism. Like, they reference the fact that he drinks hard numerous times. And I even like the fact that it's like one day he's um, he makes a, a, a call on a payphone to his wife, and he's got a six pack of Miller sitting next to him on the other payphone. And so he's obviously going to drink that. Well, then, same day later, when he checks into the hotel, uh, or the motel with Ellie, he's just like, oh man, God, I need a heart, like, I need a drink. I'm like, didn't you just, you drank that six pack, obviously, because he needs to go somewhere else to get a drink. So he already had a six pack, and then he's going to get a bottle of hooch. This guy is a booze hound. And it's funny because it's like, why would you even think to put this in a script and ride it so hard? Like, he's supposed to be the hero, and it's just like, this guy's just a freaking drunk. And then the other thing is, why is he not at the hospital doing his job? Who's covering for him? Are these his days off? I don't know. It seems like he just up and left the hospital. It's so weird. Like, there's so many gaps in this, and you're just like, what about this? And then what about this? But it's fun. I, I mean, I kind of like that stuff where it's just like, just because it, it's a good time. So, um, going to the whole motel thing. So, Dan says, Tom Atkins' character, he, he says that they were going to get a couple of rooms. Okay, he legitimately says, let's get, you know, let's stay, let's get a couple of rooms. And then he only gets one room. And then not only that, but Ellie doesn't even like question it. She's just like, yeah, let's bone. It, it just, it goes from zero to 60 so fast in the bone, in the bone lane that you're just like, what is going on? And it's so weird, like the way he moves in and kisses her immediately like, her dad just died not long ago, and this was, like, the doctor, and then she, I don't know, does death make her horny? I don't know. It's such a weird thing. Or maybe death makes him horny, I don't know. She, he's, like, Bond in this. Like, women just can't. Because the other thing is, like, it's insinuated that he's been seeing the the person who's either the forensic psychologist or, or the mortician or whatever, um, or the coroner, I, th I, I mean... It's insinuated that he's seeing her. He, like, gives her a kiss at one of the times after he sees her. It's weird. Like, this guy's all over. He's throwing, he's throwing his D right and left. <laughs> or left and right, whatever. Uh, the head-ripping scene is pretty funny with the blood spurting all over the place. And it's it's especially funny because at that point you don't know about the, the robot aspect of the film. So you're just like, how is this person ripping this head right off the body? But, like... If you go back and watch that scene, like, there's a bit of a delay on when the head comes off and then the blood spurts. That's, like, you know, obviously not realistic, but it just makes it kind of funny, like, the delay and then it's just like this. It's, I like it. I laughed at it. I like it. Um, the death by laser is also funny, that whole thing. Um, but the aftermath of it's really good. Like, the actual practical effects of her face all screwed up is really good it looks really really awesome but the whole like laser like first of all lasers for movies this far back just don't hold up they don't look good on film and the fact that like a laser shoots out of this little like button the silver shamrock logo button is so weird um it was just like it's really out of nowhere and you're just like what that what happened but like i said the after effects are great um the mask making factory tour is cool like, that's a fun aspect of it. When you go through and you see all the masks in kind of different stages of being made, uh, that's fun. I think that's a really cool thing. And just, like, anytime when you're, like, 
discovering or like exploring a new uh location in a film in my opinion like something i'm not familiar with like a factory or something like that it's always very interesting like i legitimately will, will watch like um abandoned building exploration videos on youtube and stuff like i find that type of stuff fascinating so i really liked the mask factory tour for that reason where do all the bugs and snakes come from this makes absolutely no sense i don't understand how uh the okay so it's the button that has electronics in it that's turning the kid into like this pile of snakes and bugs basically like it kills him and then snakes and bugs like come out of his head um so it's the button doing it that has electronics in it but the electronics have like pieces of the stonehenge stone put in them like i don't even understand how this works and then even, like, what part is doing it? I guess the electronics is needed to, like, harness the power of the stone. And then that does it. But then where do the bugs and snakes come from and why? Like, I, it's totally like a just cause type thing. It's like, here's something crazy. Here's something wacky. Just, and at this point, when that does happen, like, you've been through enough of the film where you, you just go with it. You're just like, yeah. And then that, and then that. And then that, yes. And then obviously this gigantic snake <laughs> comes right out of the kid's head. Sure. And then goes and bites and that's, that's crazy. Uh, I got, you have got to love the impossible mask toss. When Tom Atkins character is like tied up and then he finds, finds a way to like partially get himself free. And he has a mask, gets the mask off his head, the skull mask. And then he like throws it to get it on the surveillance camera and it lands perfectly. <laughs> totally unrealistic but it's pretty funny you gotta love it nobody would ever suspect or see a moving mask uh a moving rack of masks that's the other thing like when they're sneaking around in the main area where they have the big stonehenge stone uh after tom gets loose uh tom atkins character gets loose and he gets ellie who's actually a robot at this point um when they're sneaking and they take a whole rack of these masks and they just like move it with them there were so many people and they were facing that direction. Like they shot it so that those people are like looking down at computers, but there is a thing called peripheral vision. And I guess maybe they could explain it as robots don't really have that. I don't know, but people would have seen that. And it was like, it was really out in the open pretty much too. Like when they're <laughs> moving, it's another one of those moments. just really funny. And this is like right after that impossible mask toss. So it's perfect. Um, I like how Cochran just hangs out and waits to die. Like that's another, that's another totally wacky thing is like he, when he's like clapping, I do like the moment of him like clapping. Cause they say like, he's big into like jokes and pranks and stuff like that. So like the moment where he's like, ah, I've been had, like he can appreciate that. So he's like giving a clap to Dan Tom Atkins character. So I, I like that touch of the moment, but then at the same time, he's just standing there waiting to die. He's just standing there for a long time and then he gets killed and it, it's like he was waiting for it. This is weird. And, oh, Dan's fight with Ellie then, like after they, you know, after he crashes the car and she's trying, because she's trying to kill him because it becomes apparent she's a robot. That fight scene between the two of them goes on way too long. I was just like, okay, we can move this along, please. Let's go. And that speaks to another thing. There are some scenes like that throughout the film where it just really, they stretch it out for no reason. Because this movie's runtime is a bit over an hour and a half, and it really has no right to be that much time, really. Uh, it should be cut down to at least an hour and a half, maybe a little bit less than that. I don't know. Uh, there's a good concept here somewhere, but the whole, like with the with the the sinister company and you know the chips implanted in the masks and the kids dying and, and the commercial, like all that stuff, like those are good concepts. It's a good idea for a story. But the whole, like, Stonehenge thing, it's so weird, it's so out there, it's so dumb that that doesn't work. So the story, like, if you look at it as, like, is this a good film? No, it's not a good film because it's ridiculous. And I like I like how they kind of, like, point that out a little bit at the scene where um, Cochran's kind of, like, revealing his, his evil plan to them. And he's just like, oh, and this is a stone from Stonehenge. You wouldn't believe how we got it here. Yes, nobody would believe that you got it there. Not how, but that you got it there. So I kind of feel like you have to, at that point, 
if you want it to be like a g- legitimately good film, you have to at that point explain how that happened instead of just being like, you wouldn't believe how. It's like, this is how lazy we are. We're not even going to tell you how this happened because we know it's totally implausible, but we just wanted to do it. We just wanted to do it. So, yeah. So now I'm just going to talk about some of the overall themes uh, of the film. So obviously there's the theme about the dangers of children being controlled by products and marketing, basically. that That's very, very overt it's very front and center with this film. And I think it works really well, you know, because in the 80s, that was, that was the time where things really ramped up with commercials and with particularly marketing to children because there had been research in psychology done uh, that companies were using that was saying that if you get kids at a very young age, like these these marketing campaigns will basically ingrain themselves in their heads and you can end up getting a... Um, a customer for life. So that's what they were going for. That's when commercials started becoming very juvenile and very much geared towards like cartoons and stuff like that. And then even like taking cartoons and incorporating products into actual cartoon shows, they did that as well. So I think for its time, that stuff was really cool. Um, it's, it was very pertinent at that point. So, and it's kind of like anti-capitalistic in the, in that sense too, because it's this kind of like, um, companies running rampant, being allowed to do whatever they want. No one's keeping tabs on them. Uh, and that's kind of what happens with capitalism is that companies are pretty much allowed to do whatever they want. And people are just like, oh, you know, their whole b- business is to make money. So they're making money. And this is kind of like, this is what happens when that goes too far and nobody's there to see what's actually going on. They're going to take over the world. And they're going to kill everyone. And it seems like, as Cochran says, like, kind of just for the hell of it. Just just because. Um, yeah, the, like I talked about, the repetition of the Shamrock theme song is genius, genius, genius. Because of the audience feeling the way, getting indoctrinated with it the way that the characters in the film do. Love that aspect of this film. Uh, and then, like I was saying, this is the time, John Carpenter. This is the time to do that anthology series, I think people would be very much open to it, especially if you start it up because people love John Carpenter, especially now. Do it. You're gold, man. And the last thing I wanted to say is before I do my rating is that this would be a wonderful double feature to be paired with The Stuff. Now, The Stuff came out after this, so they have a lot of similarities between the two, and I wonder if The Stuff was kind of influenced by Halloween 3 Season of the Witch. I would be interested to know if that is, if there is a connection there. But um, yeah, that double feature, I want to watch that double feature. Halloween 3 and the stuff. <sighs> be a really good night. Anyway, um, let me give you my star rating. I'm going to give two different star ratings on this one. So the first one is of the entire pantheon of films ever made, how does this rank on a five star scale with half stars in play? This film is a one and a half star film ranking it amongst like all films basically one and a half stars but when you look at it as a stupid so bad it's fun horror film how do i rate it out of five stars i'm gonna give it a three and a half i give it a three and a half in that case it is a good time it is fun it is not a good movie but it is a fun time and i will watch this more because well, this is actually this is only the second time I've watched it. It has been a bunch of years since I've watched this film, so it was fun to go back to it. There, there's some fun. But uh, hopefully, you guys enjoyed this review enough. Um, put some comments down there. I want to hear your thoughts on Halloween Three. How do you feel? There might be some people out there who are just like, I legitimately think it's a great movie, not just like it's so dumb it's fun. Um, and that's fine. I want to hear everyone's opinions on it. And um, yeah, so. The best you can do for me to pay me back on this one is just hit that subscribe. That's all I ask for. Uh, for Because um, I don't make money on any of this. I'm just doing it for fun. And hopefully this helped with the people who were let down about Halloween 3 not getting done by Joe Bob. Um, this is all I can do. This is all I have to offer you guys on this, on this front. So hopefully you enjoyed it. But hit that subscribe. Put some comments down there. And thank you for checking out this video. Until next time, keep it brutal.